We're now going to take a look at the key methods in the Java countdown latch. And as we'll see, they're very simple. <laughs> so the countdown latch only has a handful of methods that are commonly used, and they're the ones I show here. So the countdown latch's constructor is used to initialize the count. Surprise, surprise. And as you can see here, it just creates a new sync object with the count. And this count is simply used under the hood to create an instance of the abstract queued synchronizer. That's all that sync is. It's abstract queued synchronizer. Now, the reason why this doesn't work for cyclic approaches is you can't reset the count without creating a new instance of countdown latch. And so if you need to be able to reset the count, which is what you need if you want to do cyclic barriers, then you should take a look at the cyclic barrier and or the Java phaser for other ways of doing things. And we'll take a look at that later, of course. The key methods it has are countdown and await. And as you might expect, these methods count down, hence the name countdown, and they wait for the count to reach zero. If you take a look at the implementation under the hood, the countdown and await methods simply forward to the underlying methods that are part of the abstract queued synchronizer framework. So you can see that countdown calls sync release shared, basically uh, counting it down by one, and it'll go ahead and release things if it gets to zero. And then await, both awaits call various methods under the hood, like acquire shared interruptibly and try acquired shared nano, nanos and so on. And that again comes straight out of the abstract queued synchronizer framework. The countdown method has the semantics where it will atomically decrement the count by one. And when the count reaches zero, then it will go ahead and release any threads that are blocked on the await method. So it's basically sort of a, a multicast, if you will, that or broadcast that informs all the waiters that they can make forward progress when the count drops to zero. So they're going to be released. Threads that call countdown don't block for the count to reach zero before proceeding. All they do is they just decrement the count by one and away they go. In, in many ways, this is kind of like releasing a semaphore, where when you release a semaphore, it doesn't block. When you acquire a semaphore, it does block. And in fact, the semantics of countdown latches is very much like semaphore in some ways. The await methods, and there are two of them, will cause the calling thread to block until the count reaches zero. So that the non-time version of this will essentially cause the calling thread to block until the count reaches zero or until the thread is interrupted. So this is an interruptible operation. There's also a timed version. And as you might expect, the timed version will either wait for the latch to reach the count to reach zero, or until it's interrupted, or until the timeout elapses. And then you can determine based on the results that you get back what happened. Interestingly enough, there's no non-interruptible version of a wait, unlike, for example, a semaphore or a arrangement lock. So you can't say, I'm going to await for hell or high water. You can only await until either the count reaches zero, the thread is interrupted by some other thread, or in the case of the time version, the timeout elapses. So I think you'll agree with me that these are very simple methods. And what makes them interesting is not their simplicity, but what they can be used for in order to solve real problems. And we'll take a look at that in the next part of this lesson.